Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Brittany Hazard, and today I'll be presenting about my research project, uh, the development of wheat with increased levels of resistant starch. Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I went to UC Davis uh, for my undergraduate studies in genetics, and I became interested in plant genetics and breeding while I was interning in a post-harvest lab. Oh, I think somebody's moving through the presentation. Okay. Anyways, um, I became interested in plant genetics and breeding while interning in a post-harvest lab um, on campus at UCD and while in a market discovery group at the company Monsanto. And after I graduated, I worked um, for a year at Monsanto in molecular breeding technology and decided to return to graduate school. Um, so I just finished my first year in the genetics graduate group at UC Davis and joined George Dukowski's lab about five months ago. And I joined this lab because I'm interested in plant breeding and very applied plant genetics research. Um, so my project involves increasing the nutritional value of wheat. And although my project is not specifically covered by TCAP, I wanted to participate and get involved in the plant breeding training network. Uh, so here's a short overview of my presentation. Uh, first, I will give you a little introduction about the lab and wheat production in California. Then I will discuss uh, what resistant starch is and some nutritional benefits associated with it. Uh, then I'll introduce some key genes involved in the starch synthesis pathway. And finally, I'll discuss my goals of, of my project and some future directions. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned in her presentation, uh, wheat production is spread throughout the entire state in California. And because California is so large um, and has a large diversity in climate, wheat can be sown in both October through February and in April through May, um, which allows for two growing seasons. And the average annual wheat production in California is 1.1 million tons. And this is used for both human and animal consumption. And about 25% um, is exported. Did you guys just lose the presentation? Okay, I'm going to try to reload this. Okay, so can you, okay, can everybody see? Okay, um, so as I was saying, um, about 25% of this uh, wheat production goes to export, um, and California is considered a wheat deficit state, so that means that it consumes more wheat uh, than it produces, and this also means that we import a lot of wheat. Um, so the Dukowski Lab is interested in wheat breeding and genetics, and we have a pretty big group of 30 people, including postdocs, visiting students, lab techs, PhD students, and undergrad students. Um, and there are various uh, traits of interest, um, including disease resistance, grain protein content, flowering time, which Rebecca talked about last time, uh, drought, and Tyson's going to talk about that today and my project, which has to do with nutrition. Uh, so my project involves looking at the nutritional value of wheat, and specifically starches. Uh, wheat provides a good balance of proteins, fats, uh, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals required for human growth and health. And starch is the most important polysaccharide in the human diet and is a major component of the wheat kernel. Um, it composes about 70% of the dry weight of the wheat kernel. 
Um, so what is resistant starch? Um, resistant starch is starch that is physically inaccessible or digestible in the small intestine. Um, and some undigested starches move into the large intestine where they ferment and take on the role of dietary fiber. Um, and since these starches are not digested, they do not provide any energy, and they're sometimes called non-glycemic carbohydrates. And resistant starches are naturally found in seeds, legumes, and unprocessed grains. And so as I mentioned before, resistant starch plays a role similar to dietary fiber with beneficial health effects. And studies have been done showing that resistant starch can provide protection from several diseases, such as colon cancer, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, osteoporosis and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so, for example, using resistant starch in food products prote protects against obesity by increasing the fiber content without affecting the taste or texture of food, um, reducing the amount of calories in food items, keeping you feeling fuller for longer, um, and it also um, helps with lipid oxidation, so burning fat, essentially. And so it's been reported that high, am high amylose starch correlates with the um, amount of resistant starch in food. Uh, so starch is accumulated in the amyloplast organelles and is composed of both amylose and amylopectin. Um, Amylose has a linear shape and has about um, 10,000 uh, glucose polymer subunits, and it composes about 20 to 30 percent of the starch in the wheat endosperm, whereas amylopectin has a more branch shape and has about 100,000 to a, a million polymer uh, or glucose polymer subunits, and it composes about 70 to 80 percent of the starch in the wheat endosperm. So here's a picture showing the branching differences uh, between amylose and amylopectin. We're, we're not seeing that picture, Brittany. Oh. Okay, I think you guys missed my last three slides. Um, I'm not really sure how to fix it. It's showing up on my screen. Um, okay. Oh, we lost the we lost the slideshow. Can you guys see this slide? We're on. Is so this is search for us? Is this is search good with for us? Yep. Oh, okay, I think you. I talked about these slides, but um, this was just a picture of the amyloplast organelle um, where starch is stored and in a little chart talking about amylose and amylopectin. Okay, so can you guys see my picture of amylose and amylopectin now? Yep. Okay, um, so this picture shows the branching differences between amylose and amylopectin. Um, and as I mentioned before, it has been reported that an increase in amylose content correlates with an increase in resistant starch. And this is because amylose can have a tightly packed structure, um, so it makes it more resistant to digestion. Uh, so the main goal of my project is to increase the level of amylose um, content in the wheat endosperm to see an increase in the level of resistant starch. Hmm. Okay, can you guys see my next slide? I just want to make sure it's working. Okay, um, so there's different genes involved in starch synthesis. Um, so for amylose synthesis, you have a granule-bound starch synthesis or synthase. Um, 
for amylopectin, you have starch synthases, um, starch branching enzymes, and starch debranching enzymes. Um, the gene I'm interested in underwent a duplication event in wheat. And the paralog gene copies are named SBE2A and SBE2B, uh, which both encode starch branching enzymes involved in amylopectin synthesis. So the idea is that by knocking down these genes involved in amylopectin synthesis, uh, we hope to see an increase in amylose synthesis, and thus an increase in resistant starch content. And so there have been experiments done to silence SBE2 genes in wheat, uh, but these have involved transgenic methods. Um, one RNAi silencing experiment um, by Sestelli et al. Um, showed RNAi silencing of SBE2A, um, which had an increase um, of amylose content from about 30 to 70 percent um, of starch in the wheat and nuts farm compared to the normal 20 to 30 percent amylose content. Uh, so our lab is focused on non-transgenic methods of creating SBE2 mutants using tilling or targeted induced local lesions in genomes, um, which Rebecca described in her presentation last time. Uh, so just a reminder, tilling is a reverse genetic technique used to knock out genes and um, the method combines chemical mutagenesis uh, with different DNA screening techniques to identify uh, point mutations in a target gene. So my target gene uh, was SB2A and SB2B. Uh, so here are some examples of uh, tetraploid telling mutants that the lab has identified. Uh, so EMS, the chemical mutagen uh, used, typically generates G to A and C to T mutations. And this can cause uh, different mutations, such as uh, splice site mutations. It can introduce premature stop codons or create mutations that just code for different amino acids. Um, so you can see here that one of, I don't know if I have a pointer, but one of these mutations um, uh, introduced a premature stop codon. And I have a lot of splicing junction um, mutations. Uh, so this chart shows the telling mutations um, that we have for SBE2A and SBE2B in both pasta, um, tetraploid, and hexaploid bread wheat. Um, so here we have the different um, combinations the tetraploid wheat, so we have SBE2A um, in uh, pasta wheat in the A and B genome, SBE2B in the A and B genome, and we also have the double mutant combination of SBE2A and SBE2B in both the A and B genome of tetraploid wheat. And we're still working on getting some of the different combinations in hexaploid wheat. Uh, so the overall goal of my project is to develop both pasta and bread wheat with increased levels of resistant starch. Uh, but in order to achieve this, there's uh, many questions that still need to be answered. Uh, the most important question is whether or not the different tilling mutations confer an increased amylose phenotype. Uh, so in order to test the phenotype, various combinations of the different mutations must be produced. And this involves combining the SBE2A and SBE2B mutations in the A, B, and D genomes of hexaploid wheat, as well as in the A and B genomes of tetraploid wheat. Um, and some additional work that needs to be done, the SBE2B mutations um, still need to be identified in the D genome of hexaploid wheat.
So during my rotation project in the lab, I um, had a mini project and mapped the genetic distance between SBE2A and SBE2B in the, in the A genome of tetraploid wheat. So both of these paralogs are located on chromosome 2A. In addition, they're located on um, chromosome 2B of tetraploid wheat. My results showed that the paralogs are 1.4 centimorgans apart. Um, and this project was important because it allowed me to combine both the SBE2A and SBE2B mutations onto a single chromosome. And this will be useful in determining the necessary dosage effect for both mutations. Um, so if we have plants with both mutations, we could see the effect the phenotypic effect compared to an individual with a single mutation. So currently in the lab, I am preparing for a field experiment in fall, uh, which I will grow plants uh, with different combinations of SBE2A mutations in the A and B genomes of tetraploid wheat. Uh, so these plants will have either SBE2A mutations in either the A genome only, the B genome only, or both genomes. And then I will measure the amylose content um, and amylopectin content phenotype using starch samples in the um, Megazyme amylose amylopectin kit. And so an ultimate goal of my research involves exploring the different combinations of the mutants uh, in the different genomes and measuring the resulting amylose content. And after determining, after determining um, how many mutations are necessary to see a significant increase in amylose content, uh, the mutations can then be used in breeding. And hopefully, um, in the future, nutritional studies using an increased increased amylose wheat can be performed to assess the beneficial health effects of um, increased amylose wheat or wheat with increased levels of resistant starch. And so I'd like to thank the Dukowski lab members, my PI, George Dukowski, the TCAP grant, and my funding, the UC Discovery Discovery Research and Training Grant. Um, the UC Davis Jastrow Research Fellowship. And I wanted to see if you guys had any questions about my project. So I'm wondering how many mutants you ended up having to screen to find um, the ones that you wanted. Actually, um, not the person who did the screening. Um, so I'm not actually sure how many mutants had to be screened. Um, I could reference a paper. Um, Brittany, can you hear me? Um, yeah. This is Rebecca. Um, I've worked a little bit in developing the tilling population or um, uh, helping with some other alternate methods of screening it. But in our hexaploid population, we have approximately 1,500 individuals, um, and we're pretty close to that in the tetraploid as well. And um, basically, the way that we figure out how many individuals we need to screen is by the density that they um, will support mutation. And so um, off the top of my head, I think in the hexaploid, it's something like um, one mutation in every 40 kilobases or something like that. And so um, uh, in a population of this size, we expect that we can find one mutation every uh, about one, uh, one every 1,000 base pairs. So we figure that we can knock out any gene and at least get, um, at the very minimum, a deleterious amino acid, sub amino acid substitution. And if... Um, if we're lucky, then we get uh, a mutation at a location that is a splice site or um, a premature stop codon.
Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Um, just a quick one. Brittany, do you, um, I may have kind of lost consciousness for a second, but I was just wondering, um, what are your plans for, um, as far as quality tests? Will you do um, bakes of the material and that, just those sorts of things? I think, um, the first major goal is to actually see if we can um, get the increased amylose phenotype that we're looking for and then um, move on to seeing if it affects the quality. I know that um, in a couple of papers I read, it um, the high amylose starch does show a difference in like the morphology the starch granules, I'm not sure um, how much an effect it would have on, um, you know, breaking quality or dough quality, um, but that's definitely something we'd have to consider um, if we want to move this um, and use the trait for plant breeding. Um, 